Lou Fisher, thank you so much for joining us. It's good to be here. Why don't we start with your background? You know, so where did you start off, the arc of your career, and uh, what you're doing now? Okay, I started off in undergraduate school as a major in chemistry and did some graduate work in uh, physical chemistry. Uh, then went in the Army for two years and came back to New York City. My folks were from New York City, and I wanted to write in New York City, and that's what I began to do. And went back to graduate school, this time in political science and law, and got my PhD at the New School for Social Research and uh, taught at Queens College for three years. And one, one last point, in New York City at night, often I would go out and listen to lectures. And the lectures I liked, not those uh, from academics, um, ones I liked were those who worked either for city government or state government or something else where big issues came up and in order to solve them, they had to work with other people. And uh, that appealed to me. So I, I decided to leave Queens College and join the Library of Congress. I learned about, they had a unit there at that time called Legislative Reference Service. They worked with members and committees and subcommittees and that appealed to me. So that's what I did for the next 40 years. And eventually Legislative Reference Service became Congressional Research Service. So I was very fortunate to be uh, being not just academic, but uh, applying of what I knew and working with other people on, on big issues. That's what I did. And at CRS, you know, was it mainly legislative branch stuff or what, you know, did you have a focus area during that time or were you really doing all kinds of different work? Well, one thing I started off right away, the year before I joined Library of Congress, I'd written a law review article on, on the issue of whether presidents could refuse to spend appropriated money, whether they could impound money. And I, I wrote the law review article saying the presidents did not have that authority. And as a result of that article, I immediately began working with House and Senate committees on legislation to deny the president that authority. And um, it, it, it passed. And uh, a couple of years ago, the New York Times said that President Nixon vetoed that bill, but he signed it. And uh, I, I have evidence of that because in my house on the wall, is a letter President Nixon sent to me, dear Lewis Fisher, I, I'm signing the Impoundment Control Act. Um, in my imagination, I, I had him saying, uh, dear Lou, uh, thank you for curbing presidential power. But th that was a good example of uh, uh, doing something to be practical and working with other pe people and uh, on, on, a, on, a big, on a big issue. So that, that was uh, spending power, but I did war power. I did anything involving all three branches. And so the CRS, you know, you were there and it's basically, it's a uh, former, uh, it's former institution. So can you talk about how that institution of CRS kind of evolved as you were there uh, from the beginning until when you left? Well, I think for decades, uh, one thing that Congress did in changing its name to Congressional Research Service, it created these new positions of GS-16 and GS-17. And, uh, and, and many of my colleagues in CRS also uh, worked with committees and testified. That's what we did. And then um, after being in CRS for 35 years, I was brought to the front office saying I had violated the CRS policy of neutrality I never even heard the word, and I had never been neutral on impoundment or anything else. And, um, and I took the matter to the general counsel's office, the Library of Congress, and they said CRS couldn't, had no, no grounds for uh, uh, discipline, disciplining me or doing anything about that. So I ended up at 35 years uh, going to the law library of Congress, and they told me, the law librarian said, you keep doing what you've been doing, forget about this neutrality business. So I spent five years there and uh, after 40 years uh, left and had a, um, and I will say uh, not just this neutrality business, but otherwise I saw a great decline in the capacity of CRS to do the professional work that Congress needs. And we can talk about that. Sure. Um, well, in, in terms of what kind of brought you into the into politics in general, or at least in terms of the, the research side of things, you know, what was it, what were your kind of your broad areas of interest that, that drew you in to first kind of like, it sounds like the local side and then ultimately the national stage? Well, you know, I started off on that budget issue and Common Control Act, 
but I got involved in anything involving separation of powers. And that, would, of course, would include the war power. Uh, and I, I was on, uh, at one point, I was detailed out of the Library of Congress to the Iran-Contra Committee. And I was the research director there. Uh, so I, I testified, on, I don't know if you know anything about the state secrets privilege, but um, it's, it's been abused over the years. And I ended up testifying a lot on that issue and hope that Congress would pass legislation to limit what presidents could do under quote, state secrets. And unfortunately that legislation never passed. So I think anything involved in the uh, separation of powers uh, would be open to open for me. So why don't we then start with the with this whole concept of secrecy? You know, so this this series is really focused on Congress, um, but one of the key information sources Congress relies on is information from the executive branch, right? And so you can imagine a scenario where there's everything that happens in the executive branch is transmitted to the legislative branch. And then you can imagine another scenario where zero information comes from the executive branch to the legislative branch. And I'm curious in all your work, you know, you know, how have you explored that issue and where have you come out in terms of what you think is appropriate in terms of sharing? Well, I think one of the big problems uh, for decades now is where the executive branch claims it has special expertise in, in the national security area, particularly with the intelligence communities. And like any human institution, uh, CIA and any other institution can make mistakes, not only make mistakes, but not admit making mistakes. So a good example of that, of course, would be George W. Bush saying he had to use military force against Iraq because for six reasons, Iraq had weapons of mass destruction and we went to war and he asked Congress for authority and Congress passed legislation and we went to war and then we learned that all six of the uh, claims were, were empty. So that's been a big, big problem in the intelligence community. It's very secretive. And, and, and then they, and it turns out that they uh, uh, make massive mistakes and don't, don't admit to them. So th that, that's a big problem. Uh, and I think, um, you know, Supreme Court in, 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 the, in the decision some years back on Citizens United argued that, concluded that corporations are like you and me, they're like human beings and they, they have a right to spend whatever they want on, on, on campaigns. <clears throat> um, so when I talk to staffers today in Congress, they, they tell me that their member of Congress spends about half his or her time raising money for himself and herself and for the party. So they don't have time to do the oversight that they used to do uh, in committees and subcommittees. So that's been a big decline. And if you're not doing oversight, uh, there are going to be a lot of big errors that continue at, at, at high cost. So for the, the concept of secrecy in the area of intelligence, you know, in your mind, is there some kind of demarcation between what shouldn't flow to the legislative branch versus what should flow? Uh, you know, do, certain criteria or, you know, when, when do things, you know, compromise, I guess, uh, national security when they're shared with the legislative branch? I don't see any, any limits or any clear areas of this, on this, but not that. I think Congress, in order to do its job on not just legislating, but uh, oversight needs access to information, no matter how sensitive it is. So I, I would never accept the notion that the executive branch has the right to withhold certain types of inf information. And uh, I, that I think uh, uh, leads to at, at high cost. Are there other areas of information within the executive branch that you think uh, should be better shared with the legislative branch? I, I can't think, maybe you can, uh, of any type of information that could uh, be withheld from Congress for, for different type of reasons. I don't know why the executive branch should know things that Congress cannot. Well, one thing I was thinking about is in the area of deliberation, right? Before a decision's made uh, in any particular direction, um, whether it's a, you know, whatever kind of decisions that the executive branch has to make on a daily basis, you know, almost in the same way that Congress is accountable to the written outputs that it makes, right? In terms of laws, et cetera. 
you know, is it the same with the executive branch where the internal deliberations of the executive branch should be some kind of private area and only the decision should be made public? Uh, or do you think even the decision making, the, you know, the, the conversations within the cabinet, et cetera, should those also be made transparent to the legislator? Well, I think anything that ends up being part of public policy should be shared with Congress so that it can legislate properly and can do oversight. It's kind of silly, but I'm thinking of what movie some president watched one night, uh, maybe uh, not necessary to reveal that. Right. That's, you know, and again, you know, as we look at technologies over the long run, right, we'll be able to know more and more about individuals. You know, some people would would conceive of a utopia where uh, every congressman had a body camera on all day long, right? And that would be their definition of a transparent utopia. Maybe, you know, in, you know, for me, that would, you know, cross some kind of a line, right? There needs to be some kind of privacy in order to carry on um, normal kind of functioning for an individual dignity. Is there something similar applied to the, could, could you apply some similar logic to the uh, executive branch where some things are definitely shareable, whereas others, you know, sort of cross the line into um, getting less sort of optimal outcomes. If 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 everyone in the in the executive branch is then just thinking about how such things will appear on TV, I haven't heard any good arguments as to why any information having to do with public policy can be withheld. From Congress. Have you heard of any areas uh, like that? I think what you just mentioned related to public policy, maybe that's the key differentiator, yeah. right? So if, if uh, any, you know, if the meetings aren't related to a public policy, then, then, it, it, then it shouldn't matter uh, for the legislative branch, unless, of course, they indirectly bear on it, which you could potentially argue would be anything. I, I like to bring up something that I think relates to what we're talking about, because um, some years back, uh, there is an issue brought to the Supreme Court, and um, it had to do with with a statute that allowed one House of Congress to act uh, to prevent someone uh, 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 some action against an individual. And one 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 House would be a one. And it was called a legislative veto. Sometimes it's a one House veto. Sometimes a two House veto. And um, that came to the Supreme Court, and I wrote in the Washington Post an article saying that no matter what the Supreme Court does or wants, wants to decide, the legislative vetoes will continue, particularly those at the committee level and the subcommittee level. And, uh, and that was a year before the Supreme Court decided to strike down the legislative veto. And those committee vetoes and subcommittee vetoes have continued. Uh, so the Supreme Court didn't know what it was doing. Uh, well, I, I think it's a very good uh, example where the two branches worked out uh, uh, an arrangement uh, going back after World War II uh, that agencies can do the best job they can on telling Congress what they think they need for this coming fiscal year and, uh, and get, get it passed through the different types of committees in the House and the Senate. But then once the money is appropriated and the fiscal year begins, suddenly things pop up that no one could anticipate. And, and there was an arrangement uh, said that if, with, with the fiscal year beginning, if, if an agency thinks that, although we had asked for this and it got that, um, this new thing uh, is a higher priority and they would like to take some money uh, to shift it uh, from what they got to, to this, this new, new issue but they never thought they could do that by themselves. They would have to come to those committees of jurisdiction and tell them what they'd like to do and get permission from those committees. And, and the record shows, uh, no matter what the Supreme Court said, there's no final word because those legislative vetoes have continued up to this present day. And I think it's a, I think it's a reasonable thing that, that the executive and legislative branches understood and the Supreme Court did not. And so I, I assume that crosses over in your thinking also to regulation. So whatever regulation the executive branch may pass, Congress should have an oversight and uh, ultimately could reverse or change any of that at its whim. Is that right? Exactly. Uh, that's another area which, which should be subject to congressional hearings and, and review, and, uh, and, and there should be an opportunity for Congress by legislative veto 
committee veto uh, uh, to reverse what the executive branch wants to do. And I think, um, you know, even though the Supreme Court didn't know what it was doing on the legislative veto case, the charter case, um, uh, executive branch people do. And if you if you read books by people who had been uh, secretary of a particular uh, agency, uh, they they will say in their book, uh, I, I needed money to be shifted from here to there, and I had to go up to Capitol Hill to meet with committees. So uh, it's a good example of the Supreme Court deciding a case not knowing what it was doing and never really correcting it later on. But but the fortunately the two uh, 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 legislative and executive branches uh, have that uh, policy continue, and and, and it's, it's a thoughtful, reasonable one. I'm curious about your thoughts since you've been thinking about these issues so long as it relates to uh, at least regulation in particular. You know, obviously, the way the Constitution was written out, Congress could just do all the regulating itself, right? It outsourced this regulation to the executive branch with some oversight, right? Uh, do you think that was a good move? Should Congress have, have given the executive branch that capability or should it have built that capability itself to do the regulation? Well, that's a good question. I've never seen much written on that, whether Congress itself could do what is generally done by uh, the agencies. But I think it works best with the agencies um, taking the quote lead, but not thinking it's independent of Congress, but uh, uh, coming to those committees of jurisdiction and telling them, in this case, an agency regulation, uh, they'd like to do this and that and, and get Feedback, and I think that's a very healthy thing to come forward and be open and uh, and uh, and have each each branch respect each other. Well, let's go back to the uh, the notion of money that you brought up earlier. Um, so you've done a lot of writing on the budget and the president's relationship to the budget. Can you talk me through kind of the questions or the the, the areas you've explored related to the budget? Um, and, you know, where you've come to and, you know, what should Congress really be doing on the budget and what should the president be doing, if anything? Well, I think, uh, you know, the power of the purse, uh, uh, the frame is understood, uh, belong to Congress. So there's this new, a lot of talk, including the most recent member of the Supreme Court about originalism. And there's this belief and when you're interpreting the Constitution, you should be... Um, uh, guided by originalism, namely what the framers thought at that time. And I've never been, uh, I, I'm an originalist in the sense I believe in the separation of powers, and I believe in checks and balances, but I'm not an originalist in the sense that uh, <clears throat> we know that the framers uh, allowed slavery to continue. And we know that the framers uh, didn't allow women to vote or to get educated or be any kind of professions. So there are a lot of things originalists could uh, be a green light for that I am not. I am interested in this concept of, you know, bottom-up budgeting versus top-down budgeting. And this is something I kind of explored with Alan Schick on the program once before. And, you know, you know his opinion is that the, the way Congress budgets is an incremental kind of budgeting process. So you take the, the previous year as a given and you make modifications uh, versus a kind of each year or each two years thinking anew about the, about the budget. So that was one kind of framework through which to view the budgeting process. And of course, the other is that today, you know, the, con you know, the, the president presents a budget to Congress and the Congress does whatever it wants with it. But that wasn't in the original design. The original design was just for Congress to come up with the budget. Um, so I'm curious about where you come out since you've, you've, you've written on this subject and, and it, it is a separation of powers question. Well, I, I think what you just said is correct. Uh, and it took a while for the Budget uh, Act uh, to formally give certain uh, powers uh, to, the, to the executive branch, particularly the president submitting it. And I think you and I would have to wonder how informed the president is in submitting the budget. It's a very complicated process in all the different agencies. And I don't think any president has the time or uh, uh, in information to actually do that. So to me, it's a little bit of a myth the president presents the budget. He does, he does formally present the budget, but it doesn't mean he knows uh, what, it, what is in the proposal. Um, 
So it's the starting point. And that's all it is. It's a proposal and then Congress can do what it likes. And from the Congress's process point of view, what is your opinion on that process? Obviously, it doesn't work right now, but I'm curious about, given your observations over the years, what do you think the process could be or should be on the legislative side? Well, I think they have every need and obligation to look at a proposal. And over the years, uh, uh, they know about those programs and how effective they have been. Uh, so, but again, as we just talked earlier, uh, how much time do members of Congress have? Uh, if they're uh, spending half their time raising money for themselves and for the party uh, to, to, to be informed about all the things that they used to do and were obligated to do. So I think Congress, uh, um, I, I don't think it's in a position uh, to carry out its constitutional duties. And in terms of timing, you know, for individual members to focus on that or even specialized committees to focus on that is, a, is definitely a challenge in terms of the capacity and the time commitment. Um, and what about in terms of the process itself, where you have a budget committee versus a, um, you know, appropriations committee versus authorizations committee, uh, authorization uh, committees. Do you, do you have a, a perspective on whether that structure is the right one in the long run, or should there be some other kind of structure to address uh, figuring out how much money to collect and spend? No, I think what you just said is correct. All the duties that Congress has, uh, budget authorization, appropriations, et cetera. Um, but it all gets back to the same question we've been discussing, uh, that the structure uh, makes sense but do members have the time uh, to, to carry out those duties, uh, given uh, how much uh, money, time is being spent on, on raising money for the, their campaign and for the party's camp, uh, for the, their own party. So I, I think, uh, I don't know how many members of Congress today are admitting that there's a problem on their ability to carry out their constitutional duties. Well, I think a lot of them in private would tell you that. Uh, you know, in terms of public, I don't think they're going to say they don't have, they don't do their, their constitutional duties. Um, but I think in, in reality, you know, there's a tremendous amount of pressure on them to spend time doing things that aren't related to legislation and oversight. Um, in terms of the, the other separation of powers questions that you've addressed over the years include the war powers, right? That's something that you've written extensively about. Can you talk about, you know, what, what are the issues that you see there and, and how has that evolved over time? Well, I think the framers, uh, there were a few framers, probably Alexander Hamilton would be one who would have liked to uh, follow the British system and uh, uh, have, have a lot of power uh, at, at the royal level. But I think the framers were uh, rejected that, that British model and, and they did admit that uh, particularly when Congress is out of session, that the president might have to repel sudden attacks. But other than that, uh, any, any going to war, any military action, whether it's called war, authorization, whatever you want to call it, uh, had to be done with Congress and at the approval of Congress. And that system worked well. Uh, there were a couple of exceptions, uh, certainly uh, us initially going to war against Mexico on disputed territory and a lot of deception there. Uh, but otherwise, uh, uh, Congress either uh, declared war, World War I, World War II, or authorized war. Uh, but then, then the big uh, changes came where presidents began to not to come to Congress for declaration of war or authorization, uh, instead going to outside bodies. And uh, the, the, the pathetic, pathetic thing was uh, Harry Truman um, at, at a certain point, wrote a letter to a senator, and it went in the congressional record. You can read it. And Harry Truman, as president, said, I want you to understand that if I ever use military force, I must first come to Congress to obtain authority. So that was Truman's understanding. Then a, a couple of years after that, uh, the Korean War comes up, and uh, Truman uh, uh, sends troops over there, and, and he was asked, uh, is, is, is what you're doing 
in, in Korea, is that a war? And Truman says, no, it's not war. And then the person asks, is it a UN police action? Yes, that's it, it's a UN police action. So now you see a door opening where under the constitution, instead of presidents having to go to Congress, they'll go to some outside body, the, the, the UN Security Council. And then uh, uh, Clinton used military force around the globe and never came to Congress for authority. And he would argue that the use of military force in different countries is not war. And uh, then after the military action was over, after a long period of time, and a lot of deaths on both sides, uh, Clinton would say, uh, after the war was over, I'm sorry to use the word war, but after, after the military action was over, uh, Clinton would say, it was an awful war. I'm glad the war is over. So we have presidents playing games with words and Congress not, not pushing back. Um, I think, I think any, any president who wants to sidestep Congress and get authority from this UN Security Council or for some NATO allies uh, uh, should be uh, removed from office. But that, that would take a Congress to uh, uh, value it, itself uh, and, and Congress isn't doing that. So do you think that's the fundamental problem then is Congress not valuing itself and its own responsibility? Yes, big problem. I'm sure that the challenge is the precedent and the culture in which they find themselves currently, right? And so I wonder in your thoughts how that culture evolved, right? You're saying the the demarcation was Truman. And I'm presumably Truman didn't ask for uh you know, you know, didn't want didn't ask Congress to do its job because he thought it wouldn't. Right. And so how did we get to that point is a is a is a question I wonder. Well, Truman, of course, if he wants to go to war in Korea, and eventually that damaged him and, and the Democratic Party, uh, particularly when uh, General MacArthur decided to take troops and go right up to the Chinese border and the Chinese troops came in and a huge loss of life on both sides. It seems like from that, there'd be enough members of Congress with the understanding of the constitutional duties to see that Congress has to uh, uh, recover its powers. I'm thinking of... When I was at Library Congress, there was a proposal legislation that uh, the deficits at, the, at that particular time were, were very, very high. And, and, and how, how can we better control um, the federal deficits? And, and the proposal was that the Comptroller General in the General Accounting Office uh, would receive. Um, expert advice from different groups. And the Comptroller General uh, could then uh, uh, cut, cut those amounts. And I, uh, I was asked to testify on that. And I said, but what you're asking the Comptroller General to do is to be an executive official. He's a legislative branch official. You can't do that. And that eventually got litigated and, and uh, the Supreme Court agreed that uh, uh, the statute was uh, impermissible, allowing legislative officials to carry out executive duties. So that, that was quite an interesting example. So I, I'd like to talk a little bit about the CRS, you know, where we started the conversation, um, you know, because one of the problems, as you mentioned, is con congressional capacity. Um, there's a willingness on the one side, there's a capacity on the other. Right. Um, you've identified the lack of will. That's a big problem. But there's also this concept of capacity and CRS is a, is a core component of that capacity. Can you talk about the evolution of the CRS while you were there and where you think it is now and its role in congressional decision making? Well, in talking about my pleasure in those early decades at, at, at Library of Congress, uh, of course, working with staffers and committees and subcommittees and the people I worked with were careerists. Uh, it was not unusual for me to work with someone who spent 30, 40 years in Congress and uh, uh, I valued uh, it, being in touch with them very, very much. But I think uh, that has changed a great deal. I think a lot of people, first of all, the, 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 the number of staffers has declined greatly um, now 
when I was senior specialist, there were about 17 in Library of Congress, about 17 senior specialists. And then the GS-16, those are specialists, and we had about 35 or 40 of them. So today, Congressional Research Service has zero GS-16s. All of that was authorized in 1970 Act. And they have three senior specialists all within a year or two to retire. So exactly what Congress had done to strengthen itself through the CRS has, has disappeared. And Congress doesn't seem to know either that has happened or care about it. Uh, they, they understood in 1970 that they needed professional help and they upgraded CRS and CRS has definitely gone downhill. And I haven't heard of any member of Congress care about that. And I, even, even the members, even staffers I, I, I'm aware of in recent years who decided to come to committees of Congress, uh, their, their track record seems to be maybe spend three or four years with a congressional committee and, and leave and use that as a jumping point to, to do something else in town with some other agency, but not with the government. So we have declined greatly on, 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 on professional staff. Well, I think you know a number of members have, have, have discussed that, particularly the Modernization Committee, and they have increased the pay, et cetera. But you know, is that is it sufficient? You know, that's that's the real question. And is it is it uh, you know does it really move the needle? Uh, for particular senior staff and a lot of that expertise that needs to be retained. No, those are all good points. And on this neutrality business, I remember one time when I was at the Law Library of Congress, uh, one uh, senator's staff asked me for a lot of memos on a particular piece of legislation. And, and, and the, the amendments are very, very complicated amendments. I did many, many memos on that. And at one point they called and said, the senator would like to talk to you. He's on the Senate floor. And so I, I left the Library of Congress building and walked over to the room right outside the Senate chamber. And uh, the Senator came out with three of his staffers, two, two of his staffers. So the four of us were standing there, the two staffers never said a thing. And I'm talking with the Senator back and forth, back and forth. And then the Senator uh, brought up one of those amendments and we talked about that. And then the Senator asked me, how should he vote? And I paused, so I don't often get that, that kind of direct question. And I thought about it, wondering what to do. And, and since he asked me the question, I, I said, I think you should vote against. And he paused and I said, oops, I made a mistake. And uh, he said, you're right, I'll vote against. So uh, that's the kind of, uh, it's hard to uh, describe the complexity of, of, of these bills and the amendments. But um, if someone asks me to look into it, I'll look into it as best I can. If they want to ask me what they should do, I'll, 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 I'll do that. And one time on the, on the impoundment issue, I was working with a committee and then we went to markup where, where uh, they have the bill and other senators can offer amendments. And uh, the, 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 the council who should have been there wasn't there because he hadn't kept up with the issue. So we're in the room on, on markup and um, the, the, I'm sitting right next to the chairman of the committee and he recognizes some senator who has an amendment and he, uh, he, he takes the amendment on a piece of paper and he holds it up in the air and reads it without saying anything. He hands it to me and asks for my advice. And uh, I, I gave my advice. You asked for my advice, uh, whether it should be accepted or changed and so forth. But, um, not only did I work with the House and the Senate on, on that Empowerment Control Act, I, I met with a lot of ex top executive officials in the budget area. And, and I, I think all the ones I dealt with who were professionals and, and careerists said that uh, uh, Nixon uh, uh, should not have any independent power to impound money. So uh, I, I think actually those uh, top executive officials I met with were the ones who I had him send that letter to me saying he has signed to the Empowerment Control Act. <laughs> and so the CRS today really doesn't take sides, right, uh, on any particular piece of legislation. That's part of their mantra. So in your mind, uh, you think it would be better if they could take sides? Or do you think that there's a different organization that should be met, you know, created to take sides? Or what are your thoughts on that? Well, you just said they don't take sides. Uh, I uh, 
you, you, you've been told that on, on, on these issues, uh, it's taking aside is not accepted anymore. You can't do that. Well, I've seen, you know, uh, testimony and when they're asked a question, they reiterate the fact of their neutrality. Right. Uh, so it's so not just CRS people, but other people as well. Oh, CRS people is what I'm talking about. CRS people. <laughs> So do you think that's right? Or should they be able to come down, you know, pro or con various, you know, uh, uh, voice their own opinions about where the legislation should go, particularly as it relates to the functioning of the legislative branch? Yeah, not only express your opinion, but ex express why you reached that opinion. But I talked to people today, they're retired like me, and they testified frequently before committees and gave their, their view. And one time uh, on that bill that would have given powers to the comptroller general and i was uh, testifying against that before a house committee uh, and, and and at that time the, the democrats uh were in control of that committee and the, the ranking republican so the reason i testified the way i am because that happened to be the position of the chairman and i said to him if you were the chairman i'd be testifying the same way i'm i'm, I'm offering my view uh but um no, I, I, I think there's been a decline, not just in CRS, but I think in, in committee staff, uh, my understanding is the uh, turnover there is very, very rapid. You don't have a lot of careers. Well, we're doing work specifically on that to track that number uh, okay. in our data project to see how many staffers of long length still remain uh, so we can quantify that and then year by year track it to see if it increases or decreases. Uh, so we're trying to develop exactly the data that you're, you're mentioning. So, um, we have a base, an audit of every committee and every member to look at their staff tenure. So we'll, I'll be able to answer that question in several months, um, definitively. Very, very important. And I think everyone who's been, the people I talked to retired like me, uh, were literally there for 35, 40 years. And I don't know what the turnover is like now in CRS. Uh, I, now I, I do know uh, Congressional Research Service has a, a, a American law uh, division and uh, they, they brought in from the outside people to be section heads and they adopted that neutrality business and people who were very expert in areas and, and their reports would go out in the past were now being told uh, you got too much on one side added on this side and so forth. And many of those uh, attorneys uh, who had been at CRS for a long time, just uh, walked, walked away and went home, you quit. Um, so that neutrality is really un undermining all the divisions that I know of. Hmm. Well, I think it's time for us to move on to the common questions I ask all our guests, if you're ready for the next phase. So why don't we start with, uh, what do you think congressional representation should mean? What does it mean to you when a representative uh, you know, is, is, uh, is covering their constituents. What, what is the relationship between them and the constituents and who do they represent and how do they represent them? It's a very deep question. Uh, uh, yeah, they are called, we call the representative branch and they represent, but does that mean they, they just look, they just get some sort of uh, information, what's out there and how, how do you do that? Every, every, even if you're a house member, uh, uh, no matter what the size of your district, they're going to be conflicting views inside your, your district or inside your state if you're a senator. So, um, no, I would love to see if there's some studies on how dependent members of Congress are on what views are out there, because I think they can, you, you're, you're a representative, but that doesn't mean you have to salute everything you hear out there. But maybe you have some things that your, your constituents didn't know. And what about your personal opinion? Is it that, you know, the, the members should just cover, do they really represent, you know, the primary voters or the, the majority who elected them or, you know, everyone in the district or future generations, you know, where in your mind, when, when people say representation, you know, which, which one of those comes to mind? Well, I think it'd be unfortunate. I can't give you a good reason for them to just to say, these are the people who voted for me, so I will listen to them and follow their advice. And the ones who didn't uh, vote for me, I'll ignore them. I think the people who didn't uh, vote for you probably could have some good information and, and judgment. So, uh, you know, I wouldn't want uh, to see it done that way, you, where, where you would say, 
to 40, 45% of the, your, your district, uh, uh, get out of here. I, I don't care about you. <laughs> so, so the next question is really about uh, time, right? And you've brought this up uh, already about, you know, how uh, members spend their time. You know, in your thoughts, what would be kind of an ideal allocation of member time in terms of, you know, in Washington versus in their home districts or uh, working on legislation versus oversight or how much money would, or sorry, how much time would you allow them to raise money, et cetera? What's your thought on the time allocation of members? Well, I would like to see Congress overturn since the Supreme Court to me doesn't have the last word on Senator United case and throw that out. Now, a lot of people would be disturbed by that. There was a constitutional issue on quote, uh, First Amendment. Uh, but I, I, I would like to see that. Now, by the way, on the propriety of having uh, restrictions on, on, on money and campaign, and, and, and uh, Teddy Roosevelt's uh, time around the turn of the century, around 1900, there was legislation passed to deny corporations uh, the right to spend money in political campaigns. And there was no resistance to that at all. There was understand, understandable. So you go from that, which I think was a healthy time, up to Citizens United. And uh, I had urged many uh, members of Congress uh, to take action to overturn Citizens United. But in terms of the, the members' time in, in, um, in D.C., I mean, what are, what are your thoughts about their time in D.C. versus in the home district? Would you have them in the office here in D.C. all the time and go back, you know, every once in a while? Or... or you know, right now they spend, you know, Tuesdays to Thursdays really in D.C. What are your thoughts on that allocation? Well, I think Tuesday to Thursday makes sense. It's a very, very complicated job that they have. But uh, I think they have a need uh, to be back home, uh, not just to learn what's going on back there, but to tell uh, not, and not just the people who voted for you, but the people who didn't vote for you, well, some of the issues that you find of interest and share that with them. So... My next question is really around debate, deliberation, and dialogue. So you've, you know, as you said, you've been on the floor, you've been in, com you know, in committee, you know, supporting members' decision making, uh, trying to help them to come to better decisions. Right, that's ultimately the job of CRS, is so Congress can make a make better decisions. And part of that is this debate and dialogue between members, right, and between their staffs, et cetera. Where do you think that debate deliberation should happen? You know, it used to be at least partially on the floor. It still happens somewhat in committee. Where do you think it should happen? Is it in the back rooms? Is it at bars? Is it at homes, you know, in private? Where do you think this discussion should happen between members to come out with better, better decisions? Well, I think you're familiar with the Lily Ledbetter case uh, where Lily Ledbetter worked for 20 years for the firm and only learned that she was being paid less uh, than uh, men uh, doing the same job. And she uh, uh, took legal action, but when, when it got to the Supreme Court, she lost 5-4. And uh, what I liked about uh, the 5-4 decision is that the, the person arriving for the four dissenters was Ruth Bader Ginsburg. And uh, she was someone who, uh, uh, very, very saw uh, uh, constitutional law in a very, very broad sense. And she not only criticized the majority for deciding the case against a Lily Ledbetter, but she said, and she's used this word before, this phrase before, now the ball is in the court of Congress. Namely, we have decided this case, but we messed it up. So Congress, please uh, 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 fix, fix the problem. So there's a good example that you're bringing up what members can do because members are uh, <clears throat> um, very complicated, a piece of legislation, uh, but got through the House and the Senate and there's some differences between the two and they had to go to conference committee and then they um, ag agreed on legislation and went to the President of Barack Obama and he signed it into law. And uh, Congress said that members, that, that women, can file their lawsuit at any time. So uh, Supreme Court, the last word, no. And there's a good example where Congress uh, was told by a leading member of the court and of uh, the four dissenters 
to fix what we messed up in, in the Supreme Court. And that's what Congress did. So that, 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 that dialogue is quite fascinating and, and very complicated. You can imagine what it's like for the House and the Senate to uh, have that uh, placed in front of them and to act. And they did. And they, they became law. And what about between members and between senators? What have you seen as like an effective way for them to interact with each other in this way, this dialogue, this debate? Oh, that's a perfectly good question. I really don't know how that's handled. It's even just working, as you know, within your own branch of government is complicated. So the next question is really about, um, you know, what fundamental improvement do you think Congress should make to itself within the next 50 years? What kind of institutional improvement? Well, I would like to see Congress today, and I'll send you a statement I made to a House committee a couple of years ago about the decline in CRS. Uh, you know, I, I would like members of Congress today to look back around 1969-1970 when they uh, upgraded uh, CRS, and, and, and they saw that they were not in a position to effectively check uh, the executive branch, and which is, I think is true today. So I, I would like members of Congress to go back to that late 60s, 1970 period and see why they had to upgrade CRS. And for them to know that, that CRS has gone downhill, uh, uh, it, uh, both uh, gone downhill in terms of members uh, uh, on the staff, but even on the attitude, the, the, the crazy neutrality of business. So um, I think the facts are there and I, I would like to see members of Congress uh, do what they did back in 1970 to say, uh, we are not, we don't have the institutional capacity to do our uh, constitutional duty. And, uh, and, and we're going to have to take steps now. And, and part of that would be to upgrade, restore uh, CRS and, and, and restore uh, committees and subcommittees, their staffing. I think that's declined a great deal. I think this, people used to be a, a careerists on those committees. I think they've declined very far very difficult to find such people today. And you, you, can't, you, you can't be up to speed in three or four years. It takes you a decade after decade to begin to comprehend things. So it's interesting the Supreme Court and its decisions will rely on the Federalist Papers and about some matters that would come to the Supreme Court. And, and one was this notion that the president is the sole organ in external affairs. And that's from a Curtis Wright case in 1936. And all that the Supreme Court in 1936 had to do was to say, Congress has passed legislation delegating to President Franklin D. Roosevelt authority to block any military uh, uh, items going into an area in, in South America. So could Congress delegate that to the president and the Supreme Court said it could. So that, that was the decision. And yet the Supreme Court uh, piled on all this kind of what we call dicta, extraneous stuff, and not just extraneous, but erroneous. And, and one was the sole organ doctrine uh, where Justice Sutherland for the court talked about uh, president being sole organ. And it is true that John Marshall, <clears throat> when he was a member of Congress in 1800, he defended what President John Adams wanted to do was to take a British citizen who was charged with murder and transfer him to England. And, uh, uh, and at some point in this long address, John Marshall used the word the president's sole organ, but he didn't mean president is exclusive power over external affairs. He's a, he's a sole organ and said that there's a treaty that directed him to do it and he's, he's doing it. So um, although the opponents of John Adams wanted to remove him and censure him. Once they heard the full statement by, by John Marshall, they dropped it. But um, uh, the, the Supreme Court in 1936 in the Curtis Wright case, uh, uh, in, in this dicta said the president is a sole organ, suggesting uh, it doesn't, even have, doesn't even need statutory, it had nothing to do with the case at all. So I ended up writing an amicus brief uh, uh, to the Supreme Court, pointing out not just that error, but two other errors and uh, asked the Supreme Court to correct them. And uh, uh, once, you, once you read that uh, a, a decision, uh, 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 you can see that the court uh, in that case still 
of, of spoke about the president in very high terms of, of, of what the president is having unity. And I think that's almost humorous. I mean, anyone who can look at any presidency and find unity to it is uh, uh, maybe drinking too much. Uh, but um, you know, there's there's a recent case where the uh, court just carelessly of, of throwing in not only a dicta but erroneous dicta and uh, not being held accountable for it. You know, I, I criticized the court for it. I, I filed a, a amicus brief, but uh, no, I don't know what that is about the Supreme Court. I don't think it ever. It certainly blesses the presidential power. Yeah. So I guess my last question is really just around your plans. And you know, are you are you working on anything these days? When it, whether it, whether it be briefs or whether it be uh, new papers or books. I do a lot of um, um, continue to write books and articles, and, and I have a recent article in a law review that will be coming out on being critical as to how much we've uh, 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 broadened. Uh, independent presidential power and the war power. And uh, just one, one quick example of, of that, um, uh, you know, there, there ought to be an opportunity for, for the Supreme Court to see that it's made a mistake and, and to say so, and they, they can do that at times. But I think that to me, uh, admitting that you made a mistake is not just, it should not be embarrassing. It means that you're a very responsible person and I don't see the court uh, being able to do that. Many people try to get the court to correct its errors. For instance, on the legislative veto case, Charlie case, the court has never admitted that uh, they didn't know what they were doing. Um, so I think we, we build up in law schools and political science and history classes this view that the court is uh, uh, extremely competent and uh, uh, able and, and, and professional. And, um, and, and, and that's not the case. Well, thank you so much for your time. Much appreciated and best of luck with the, uh, with the coming work. Oh, it's great being with you. Thank you very much.